This is the One Verse Podcast, where we liberate scripture from religion, one verse at a time. Well, hello there, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the One Verse Podcast. I'm your teacher for this podcast, Jeremy Myers. As we're studying through the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, we come to what appears to be the final piece, the sword of the Spirit, which Paul identifies as the Word of God. So that's what we will be looking at and discussing in today's podcast episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to let you know that if you want to get more of these types of studies and insights into Scripture and theology, and you are not yet part of my online discipleship group, I would invite you to go to my website, redeeminggod.com, and at the top of every single page or post, there's a place where you can sign up to receive free emails from me, discipleship emails. These will introduce you to some of the essential truths you need to know about God, about Scripture, about eternal life, and how to follow Jesus in your life as a Christian, okay? Uh, These are the things that I have found to be the most helpful truths uh, as I have taught and learned and studied Scripture over the past several decades, and I want to teach them and pass them on to you as well. Each email is filled with information and PDF downloads and audio downloads, which you can use for your own study or to share with other people. So uh, just sign up, and it's absolutely free. Just enter your first name and your email address, and I will start sending those to you immediately. Now, the the, the place to do that is at redeeminggod.com at the top and bottom of every single page and post. All right, that's at redeeminggod.com. Now, if you are part of the online discipleship group, you do not need to do this because you have all of this information and a whole lot more inside the discipleship group. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you want to join the discipleship group, just go to redeeminggod.com slash join and you can sign up there or just click the join us button at the top of my website. All right. With that in mind, let's get into our study of the sword of the spirit in Ephesians six seventeen. Okay. So In Ephesians 6, 17, we come to the sword of the Spirit, which Paul identifies as the Word of God. And uh, the sword of the Spirit appears to be the final piece of the spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6. But in the next study, when we turn to Ephesians 6, 18, we will see that there is a secret weapon in the armor of God, which we'll be talking about in the next study. But in today's study, we want to look at this piece of the spiritual armor, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And to do that, I want to remind you of what happened in the book of Nehemiah when the Israelites returned from captivity to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You remember what happened. They came to, they returned to Israel with the blessing of King Artaxerxes to rebuild the wall. But when they got there, Not everyone in the land was happy that Israel was returning. There were enemies of Israel in the land, and they sought to destroy and kill the Israelites, to keep them from returning to the land and to keep them from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And you remember what happened? Nehemiah was aware of these enemies, and so as he assigned tasks to the people to go about rebuilding the walls, He instructed the workers in Nehemiah 4.18 to strap a sword on their side so that when enemies appeared, they could defend themselves in battle. It's the same sort of thing that you and I are supposed to do as we go about our lives as followers of Jesus. We too are supposed to keep a sword strapped to our side. Now, this is not a sword made of steel. Uh, It's not a sword that we use to kill or wound other people. Because remember, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, as Paul reminded us earlier in Ephesians chapter 6. All right, This is a spiritual sword, which we use to demolish and destroy spiritual enemies and 
to defend ourselves against all the wiles of the devil. Now, when Nehemiah and the Israelites returned to Israel to rebuild the walls, there were enemies, and we have enemies as well. The spiritual landscape around us is full of enemies all the time. And so as we go about our work, helping build and spread and advance the kingdom of God, we must not lay down our spiritual sword. We must not neglect, as we're going to see, the study and application of Scripture. If we do that, then we end up losing ground to the devil when he comes in to attack us and attack our work. And we then stop being able to build the spiritual walls and defending our moral borders and rescue the perishing in our midst. So we must take up, put on, strap around us, and use the sword of the Spirit. We need to keep our sword sharp, and we need to know how to use it best. So what we're going to learn in this study is the three things about the sword, same way we do with all of the other pieces of spiritual armor. We're going to look at how it worked for the Roman soldier, then how it works, what it is for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and then thirdly and finally, how we can take it up and put it on, how we can use the sword in spiritual warfare. All right, so let us first talk about how the sword worked for the Roman soldier, what it was, what it looked like, and how it worked. So obviously, everybody knows what a sword is. I guarantee you've probably seen swords uh, of various types in museums or in movies or just in pictures here and there. For all I know, maybe you own a type of a sword, all right? Uh, but the swords that the Roman soldiers used were a special type of swords. They were typically made of iron, and they were double-edged swords. They, uh, like most swords, they came to a point, which uh, you could use for stabbing, and then they had a guard of swords to protect the hand of the sword bearer, and they had a little metal knob on the end, the other end, the base of the hilt, uh, which the Roman soldiers could use to bash an enemy in the face or head on a backswing if they needed to, a little metal knob on the end. All right Now, one surprising characteristic about the Roman soldier's sword was that the blade was only 18 inches long, roughly 18 inches long. Now, tip, that's not very long. That's a foot and a half in length. Uh, typically, when you and I think of a sword, we tend to think about swords that are like three to four feet long. You know, these broad swords, these long swords that uh, European medieval knights carried around. And, and, and honestly, if you had to choose a sword, if there were various swords laid out on a table and you had a three foot long sword, you know, broad sword in front of you and you had an 18 inch sword, barely more than a dagger, <laughs> which would you choose? I think most people would choose the longer sword. But the Roman soldiers, the Roman military, preferred this for the shorter sword. And it's not because they didn't have the longer swords. They did. Uh, the longer sword was called a romphia or a spathe, and uh, it's closer to what we would think of as a broad sword. It was actually six to eight feet long, and uh, various soldiers at various times, Roman soldiers, used it to hack off the limbs and heads of enemy soldiers. However, a six to eight foot long sword, uh, it's pretty heavy, and it had to be carried with two hands, which meant that the Roman soldiers then could not carry a shield. And remember, we learned that the shield was the first line of defense for the Roman soldier. It was the door. The enemy could not get to the soldier unless they got past the door. Furthermore, remember, the Roman soldiers did not wear full armor. They wore uh, basically uh, armor to cover their chest and the, shield, the, uh, the, the helmet that they wore, but their arms and shoulders and legs were pretty much exposed, and so they needed that shield to hide behind. If you just have a six to eight foot long sword, a broad sword, and you do not have a shield, that leaves you exposed to arrows and, and spears. And so um, the, this, this longer type of sword that the Roman soldiers did have, it was not something that they preferred to use. The Roman soldiers also, by the way, remember, uh, Roman military battles at that time were close combat. 
And um, so the Roman soldiers preferred the shorter sword that was more maneuverable, lighter, and could be uh, more deadly in hand-to-hand -hand close combat. So the Roman soldiers used this short sword. It was called a machaira or a gladius. And uh, the sword that, uh, that's the type of sword that Paul is referring to here in Ephesians 6, 17b, right? This shorter sword, the 18 inch sword. It was light and could be maneuvered quickly and with ease. And it only required one hand to use it, All right? So that would still allow them to carry their shield. Uh, it was uh, strong enough to inflict serious damage. The blacksmith would make these. They would take a soft core of steel and then surround it with several layers of hardened steel. And that would allow the sword to be strong, but also to be able to take damage so that it would not uh, snap or break in battle. Now, in training with the sword, the soldier was taught to stab and thrust instead of cut or slash. Since the sword was shorter, only about 18 inches long, obviously you're not going to get a lot of force behind it if you are slashing or cutting with it the way you would with a broadsword. Uh, but you could stab and jab with it. And um, that actually made it more deadly because if you're just slashing and cutting, you might inflict wounds on your enemy, but uh, wounds uh, out, you know, slashes and cuts typically will not kill an enemy. However, a stab into a heart or into a lung or into the side of your enemy, obviously that is much more deadly. Um, and so a, a stab nearly always penetrates right into the torso. And so the Roman soldiers were trained to, to do it, to uh, stab and thrust with their, their, their gladius, uh, gladius instead of a slash and cut with it. All right, now, the same was true for spikes and spears and so on. Roman soldiers, uh, typically, uh, sometimes they would carry these, sometimes not. But typically, they, they would carry these spears and pikes when they were trying to advance their position on the, on the field of battle. They would form up into this tight unit, this sort of tortoise shell, which we've talked about previously, with their shields interlocked. And then they would advance onto the field of battle where they wanted to go with these while well, thrusting with their, their, their pikes or their spears, then once they got to the desired positions, they would actually discard their spears or their pikes and pull out their short swords. And that is what they would then use to defend or stand their ground on the field of battle. All right. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the short sword of the Roman soldier was primarily defensive. Remember, um, the, the, the soldiers were trained to stand their ground, not primarily to advance. They would have to advance occasionally in the field of battle, but when they got to the place they wanted to be, they were to defend their position. And although we tend to think that the sword was the one piece of offensive weapon, the one offensive weapon in their arsenal, that's not the case. It was the short sword, which was used primarily to defend their position, to stand their ground. All right. So as with all the other pieces of the armor, the, sort, the short sword is primarily used for defense. All right. Uh, once they got onto the field of battle, they would defend the ground, stand their ground, uh, which they were already standing on. Now, obviously, yes, it, it's used to attack enemy soldiers, but only when those enemy soldiers are trying to advance and overcome, overwhelm the Roman soldier who are standing their ground. All right. So uh, the, all of the pieces of spiritual armor that Paul talks about here are defensive. We do not go on the offensive in spiritual battle. Jesus has already won this battle for us. All we need to do is stand our ground on the battle, uh, on, the, on the field that has already been won for us. So even the, even the sword is not for attacking or advancing, but for defending. All right, now, what then is the sword for the Christian? What is the sword for the Christian? Well, Paul explains the sword in two ways. First, Paul states that this sword is of the Spirit, or it's the, the sword of the Spirit. It's a spiritual sword. And then secondly, Paul goes on to clarify that the sword is the Word of God. 
All right, so some people have become confused by this because in the previous parts of spiritual armor, he's talked about the shield of faith. And so what is the shield? Well, it's faith for the Christian, you know, the helmet of salvation. So what is the helmet? Well, it's salvation. And now Paul comes along and he says he talks about the sword of the spirit. And so following sort of the parallel terminology, some people said, well, the sword is the spirit. Since the helmet is salvation, the shield is faith, therefore the sword of the Spirit is the Spirit. But then Paul turns around and says, which is the Word of God? So the question then is, now wait a second, is the sword the Spirit or is the sword the Word of God? What is the sword here? And the answer to that question is, yes, <laughs> it's both, right? And we're going to talk about how that works. So uh, first of all, Paul wants to clarify, uh, maybe it would be best to say the spiritual sword is the Word of God. Remember, Paul wants us to know that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We talked about that previously. And so uh, this is a spiritual sword. It is not a physical sword. It is not a sword made of metal and steel and wood with a knob on the end with which we can attack and kill other human beings. This is a spiritual sword. However, what Paul also wants us to know is that this sword is the Word of God. All right. So, um, and, and so we also need to talk about what the Word of God is, and we'll see how the Spirit and the Word of God work together in just a minute. Now, when you think about the Word of God, uh, many people think about Scripture, the Bible, as the Word of God, or other people think about Jesus as the Word of God. As we read, for example, in John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's a little debate in Christianity about, about whether Jesus is the Word of God or the Bible is the Word of God. I've talked about this before, and I also write about it in my discipleship group. But uh, obviously, uh, in my opinion, both Jesus and the Bible are the Word of God because the Bible teaches that. We see that Jesus is the Word of God, and we see that Scripture is the Word of God. So the way I make sense of this in my own mind is that Jesus is the living, breathing Word of God, whereas the Bible is the written Word of God. Jesus is the supreme revelation of God, but without the written Word of God, we never would have learned about Jesus. So we need both. We need the written Word of God, the Bible, to teach us about the living Word of God, Jesus. Now, having said that then, which is Paul referring to here in Ephesians 6.17b? Well, the answer is neither. <laughs> Not exactly. Um, when other places refer to either Jesus or the Bible as the Word of God, uh, the, the Greek word used there is logos, or logos, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, but that is not the word that Jesus or that Paul uses here. All right. Oh, and sometimes, by the way, scripture is referred to with the Greek word graphe, which means writings. All right. Uh, but that is not that is not the word Paul uses here. He doesn't use the word graphe, and he doesn't use the word logos. Instead, Paul uses the Greek word rhema. All right. And uh, this term differs from graphe and logos. In that while those latter two terms, graphe and logos, refer to the entire Word of God, or in some cases to Jesus as the living Word of God, rhema, when you look up how the word rhema is used in the Bible, it refers to uh, speaking individual verses or passages or truths from the Bible to help us in a particular circumstance or situation. Let me help you make sense of that. Okay, so the Word of God does refer to Jesus, the living Word of God, the Logos, and the Word of God, the Logos, or Graphe, can refer to the entire Bible as the written scriptures. However, Rhema, it does refer to the Bible, but not to the Bible in its entirety, and not even to reading the Bible. It refers to speaking passages, verses, or truths from the Bible in a particular circumstance or situation. All right? um, I think probably a good way to think about this is when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, you remember what happens. He quotes 
various truths and passages and verses out of the Bible. This is Jesus using Scripture as rhema. He is speaking truths from Scripture as a way to defend himself from the attacks of the devil. And that is what Paul is referring to when he speaks about the sword of the Spirit as the rhema, the Word of God. All right? Um, If he was speaking about Jesus or the entire Bible, he would have used the word logos or graphe, but he didn't. He used the word rhema, which is speaking truths of the Bible in defense of yourself against the wiles, the deceptions, the lies of the devil. And how do we do that? Well, we do the same thing Jesus did, memorizing Scripture, learning Scripture, understanding the truths of Scripture, so that we can bring Scripture to our defense against the temptations of Satan. Uh, Paul writes about this as well in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, where he says, The Word of God helps us tear down enemy strongholds, the false and deceptive teachings spread by Satan. All right. Uh, the Word of God pierces men's hearts, shows them the truth about their sin. All right. We read about that truth all over the place. All right. So, uh, the Word of God then helps us in these. And the Spirit is what brings these truths to our mind when we need them. All right. So, that is why there's this connection here between the Spirit and the Word of God. As we learn and study and memorize and read and teach the truths, individual passages and verses and texts and ideas of Scripture, then they are imprinted in our mind. We are learning and studying them, learning how to apply them. And when the need comes, when temptation comes, when the lies and deceptions of the devil come, when the wiles of Satan try to trip us up, then the Spirit helps us. The Spirit brings to mind the truths of Scripture, so that we can defend ourselves against the wiles and the tricks and the temptations of the devil. Okay? So, that is what the Word of God is, and I think it should be pretty obvious now how then to take up the sword of the Spirit as the Word of God. Since the sword of the Spirit is the uh, individual truths and ideas of the Bible, that means that we can take up and learn to use the rhema, the individual words, truths, ideas, verses, passages of the Bible, by memorizing Scripture, studying Scripture, learning Scripture, what it means. All right? Uh, And the only way to do this, the only way to arm ourselves with the Word of God is to study and learn. Obviously, the Spirit cannot bring to mind something that you've never studied or learned. So we must exercise with the Bible until it is stamped in our minds so that when it is needed, you know, our muscle memory kicks in and the use of the sword becomes second nature and automatic. Just like the Roman soldiers. Can you imagine that the Roman soldiers, they're issued their gladius for battle and then they strap it onto their side and that's it. And their commanders say, we'll call you up when the battle's ready. No, (laughs) these Roman soldiers who wanted to survive in battle spent hours, hours, every day practicing with their sword, drilling with their sword. And if we want to be effective in spiritual warfare, then we need to do the same thing. We need to practice using the rhema, the truths, the ideas of the Bible. Sort of like um, when I was young, my parents sent me to a summer Bible camp up in Montana. And I remember that one of the things we would do is these sword drills as part of our daily chapel time at, at Bible camp, summer camp. I don't know if you've ever done a sword drill, but the way it works is uh, the, the director or the speaker says, Bible's high, and you take your Bible and you're supposed to hold it by the spine. That way there's no cheating by putting your finger in the pages where you think they might be, you know, to give you an idea, the separate in the New Testament, Old Testament, or whatever. Nope, you got to hold it by the spine. And so they would say, Bible's high, and you'd raise your Bible high in the air with your arms straight. And then the speaker would call out a verse reference, say, you know, Ephesians 2.8, whatever it is. And we would all shout back, Ephesians 2.8. And then after a small pause, the speaker would say, charge! And we all pulled down our Bibles out of the air and we frantically 
flip through it to find Ephesians 2.8. The first person to find it stands up and reads it. And if they are correct, then they get some points for their team. Now, so what were they doing? It was called a sword drill. This was uh, them teaching us to practice with our sword, with individual truths and ideas from Scripture, helping us find individual verses. Now, it would be helpful, I suppose, for us adults to do sword drills at times. Uh, not in that same way, necessarily, because finding a verse is one thing, but uh, memorizing a verse and knowing when to use it is something else entirely. So maybe as adults, we could have sword drills where we sit around and we say, look, uh, here's what happened at work the other day. My boss came to me and he said this, and he asked me to do this, and I wasn't sure if I should or not. What are some truths, ideas, passages? Not that I'm going to quote the Bible at my boss. No, <laughs> that's not the proper way to be a Christian in the workforce. But what are some proper truths that could come to mind that I myself could do, could apply, could practice in that situation? Right? Um, or how about this? Very often as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we start feeling guilty and upset about something we did, something we said, something in our past. And we start to think, God could never love me. God could never forgive me for that sin. I get emails every single day from people all over the world who are asking me that very thing. I have uh, written several things online and a couple of books and so on about forgiveness and even about the unforgivable sin in Matthew chapter 12. And so people send me emails. Yeah, but I did this. Can God forgive me? It would be good for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to say when these lies and deceptions of the devil come, God can't love you. God won't forgive you. What verses, what passages, what truths can we find in Scripture that refute these lies and deceptions of the devil, right? What truths remind us that God does love us, that he has already forgiven us of all our sins, past, present, and future? How about this? A Jehovah Witness knocks on your door, and uh, one of the things he tells you is that well, Jesus Christ is a God. He is not the only God, and all of us can work towards becoming gods ourselves. Where would you go to in Scripture to refute those ideas? Where would you go to in Scripture to say, you know what? Jesus wasn't just a God. He is the God, one and only God. Um, in, in reference to the Trinity, obviously, three persons, uh, God is, is uh, one God in three persons. Uh, but where would you prove that Jesus is God and that we are not? All right. Uh, that, um, uh, you know, how, how would you use the truths and ideas of Scripture to refute that idea? A neighbor has uh, gone through some troubling times in her life, and she is starting to ask questions about the significance and meaning and purpose of life and if there's an afterlife. So she comes up to you and says, hey, I'm going through this time in my life. Tell me, is there really a heaven? And if so, how do I go there? That actually happened to me once. I and some friends were on a beach in California around one of these bonfires you can build in a metal barrel down there. And we were just having time, a good time. It was uh, about nine o'clock at night. We were sitting around down there on the beach, enjoying the sunset, enjoying the fire, enjoying the water, enjoying the sand. Some guy randomly talks, walked up to us, I kid you not, walked up and said, hey, does anybody here know how I can have eternal life? Does anybody here know how I can go to heaven? And so we were basically straight out of high school at the time, and we hemmed and hawed a little bit, but I think we were able basically to give him a good answer. But we were not quickly, we were not as quickly prepared as we could have been or should have been. And uh, we were not quite as ready with our sword of the spirit as we probably should have been. These are the types of sword drills that you can practice, that you can do, that you can help prepare yourself for uh, as you seek to defend yourself and use your, your sword on the field of battle. Through these sorts of sword drills, we are training and practicing with the sword of the spirit so that we can defend ourselves and defend others from the lies of the devil. All right, uh, we must know the Bible well enough so that we are ready for any challenge that comes our way. We must take up scripture in the morning, read it on our lunch break, take it up at night, uh, read something before is the last thing we do before bed. I don't care. Listen to the Bible on audio or, or read books about the Bible so you can 
you know, some of the books I've written and other Bible teachers have written so that you can become familiar with the truths, the essential ideas that are found in the Bible, in the Word of God. Listen to podcasts like this one and others. So again, you can learn what Bible verses mean and how they apply to your life. Many Christians today are weak and ineffective at defending themselves against the attacks of the devil because they have no skill with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Yeah, they might have the shiniest armor. Yes, they might know that they have eternal life because they believed in Jesus for it. Maybe they know the gospel, the sandals of the gospel. They've got the perfect leather belt, the helmet with no dents or rust. But if they cannot handle the truth of Scripture, then Satan can press his attack because there's no way to defend themselves against his lies and his deceptions if you don't know what Scripture truly means. Okay, so what can you do? Yeah, study Scripture. Memorize Bible verses. More than that, though, you don't just want to be able to quote the Bible. You need to know what the Bible verses mean so that you are properly applying it to your life. Sure, attend Bible studies, read books, listen to podcasts. Okay? Uh, there's all sorts of things you can do to start defending yourself preparing and practicing with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Roman soldiers knew that their skill with the sword was their lifeline in battle. The better they were with the sword, the greater their chances of survival. And so they spent a lot of their free time practicing with the sword. And the same should be true for you and I. All right, let us practice with the sword of the Spirit. Let us fight the good fight. Let us become heroes of the faith. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and in this way, you will be able to stand your ground against the wiles of the devil. And you will bring praise and glory to your Commander-in-Chief, Jesus Christ. So that's the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. We've seen what it is, how it worked for the soldiers, what it is for us, and how you and I can take it up and practice with it. Now, everything I do and write is intended to try and help you with this. With all of the thousands of blog posts I have, this podcast, my books, and especially my discipleship group. I do encourage you, invite you to join my discipleship group. If you appreciate this podcast, some of the other things I've put out, that discipleship group is a way for you to say thank you to me because it financially supports me. It's really the only reason I am able to put this podcast out and keep writing articles on the website at redeeminggod.com. Uh, but I didn't want to just take money from people. I mean, you obviously can... can, can uh, give to me gifts to me if you want to help support what I do but I want to give back to people who are giving to me and that's what the discipleship group is all about it contains some of the, um, uh, the, the, the a bunch of courses and free books and all sorts of things that I can give to you support you with provide to you as you provide to me and it's only nine dollars a month or eighty nine dollars a year if uh, that gives you a couple free months that way by paying a year in advance and then you get access to all of those 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 resources. Now, if you're not quite ready for that, I understand. Uh, maybe you can get a taste of a little bit by just receiving my free discipleship emails. Go to redeeminggod.com, enter your name and email at the top and bottom of every single post or page, and you will start getting those emails from me immediately. Okay? So listen, if you have questions or comments about today's study, just go to redeeminggod.com, Ephesians 6, 17b. You can even search for it on Google and it'll show up. And uh, leave a question or comment there and I will try to respond to it if I am able. I'm extremely busy these days with family, marriage, and writing, and work, and everything else. But I do try to respond to comments as I am able. Uh, thank you so much for listening today. And we will see you next week. We're not done with the armor of God. There's one more piece of, of armor and it is our secret weapon. Uh, uh, that, that Paul talks about in verses 18, 19, and 20. That's what we will be looking at next week. So join us then. Okay, thank you. And practice with your sword this week, all right? Uh, get it, study it, memorize it, and try to figure out how you would respond to various situations and circumstances that the devil might throw your way. All right, we'll see you next week when we pick up with Ephesians six eighteen. See you then. Bye.